Good morning and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, my disclaimer is that I'm uh, not uh, working in an NICU right now. I'm uh, working in pediatrics and I'm in training, but I did my PhD in a neonatal ICU so um, uh, regarding neck. And when uh, conducting my PhD, trying to um, uh, find means of prevention for neck, um, I stumbled upon some, upon some issues uh, regarding the diagnosis that uh, really annoyed me and that um, um, motivated me to dig a little further into um, diagnosing neck. Um, so what really annoyed me was uh, the neck incidence around the world. Uh, this is um, a rather new systematic review of neck incidence. And uh, the incidence is between 0.01% and 70.8%. And <laughs> that's, of course, depending on what group you look at. So an entire birth uh, population, it's 0.01%. And 70.8%, that's infants below 24 weeks in California. But when you look at the infants below 1,500 grams, you see the incidence in this review study. The lowest incidence was in Japan. 1.6% and the highest in Poland, 8.7%. So in our unit in Denmark, the incidence was around 6% and um, uh, we really think we did everything right. We used human donor milk, a lot of skin-to-skin -skin care. So <clears throat> I kind of thought that our incidence should be at maybe 2%, uh, but it wasn't. So uh, when looking further into this incidence issue, I realized, like they also described in this review, that the definition of neck is not really something we agree on. So in this uh, review study, some used bell stage 1 to 3, some used bell stage 2 to 3 as a definition of neck, some used the Vermont-Oxford network definition, ICD-10 was used, ICD-9 was used, and others simply just made their own definition which um, fitted what they could find in their files. Um, so um, I wondered, is the difference that we see in incidence a true difference that we can use um, to uh, get knowledge? Because if Japan really has 1.6% and we have 6% neck incidence, we should really look at what they're doing in Japan. But maybe some of the difference we see is mainly due to uh, different infants being diagnosed with neck. So I wanted to look a little further into bell staging system, which is the one that we use in Denmark, and I think it's really widely used. Um, so, um, bell staging system was developed in the 70s, and it's supposed to, uh, you're supposed to be able to use it bedside only by looking at the infant and looking at the radiographs. So, you have some abdominal signs, that's gastric tenderness, um, aspirates, you probably know them, systemic signs, signs of seps sepsis like signs, and then some radiographic findings like pneumopeitoneum, um, pneumatosis, etc. And then you divide it into three stages. And recently, I think most people agree that there is also a disease called spontaneous intestinal perforation that you need to separate from the neck cases. So that's like a build on on the neck staging, the bell staging system. So I went back to uh, the original article from 78, where Bell, he studied infants born in 74, 75. And when you look at them, is this a pointer? Yeah. They're around 33 weekers and uh, around 16, 1700 grams. So I have a cohort from 2006 to 16, and they are way more immature and they only weigh around a kilo. So it's an entirely different population actually that suffer from neck contemporarily. And does that have <clears throat> anything to do with what we see when we look in the bed? Do they have different symptoms or are the symptoms the same? Um, this is just um, the, neck, uh, the neck three cases, and when we look at them, um, we can see the blue ones are the ones from the 70s, and the green ones are the ones from my cohort. <coughs> and on the y-axis, you see how many infants suffered from the symptom. And uh, you can see here that much, many more of my infants had gastric aspirates, and a lot fewer than Bell's infants had gastrointestinal bleeding and my infants were more systemically affected, probably because they were more immature. Um, and this holds true also for the neck two cases and the neck one cases. So the symptoms are also different now than they were in the 70s. So I wondered, can we even use the bell staging system now that the neck infants are so, so much more different and we're supposed to use the symptoms to 
stage the infant and now the symptoms are different, can we even use the bell staging system anymore? So uh, we published this article with a very long title, um, but uh, what we wanted to do was um, we were inspired by other next studies and other studies in general, uh, using um, letting the data talk by using some new uh, statistical um, analysis like principal component analysis. So that's basically you take uh, neck infants and take the urine from them and you have other neck, uh, infants without neck and you take the urine from them and you look at all the um, proteins in the urine and you look, look at the patterns of how, the, how these proteins, um, how the, the amount of proteins are in the uh, urine from neck infants and from not, not neck infants. And you then look at the patterns and see is the pattern different in neck infants than in non neck infants. And then you can tell from the urine whether or not the infant has neck. That's the dream at last. Um, and we wanted to see, can we do this with clinical symptoms as well? And look after patterns in the infants and see, can we maybe group these infants differently? Or do they group according to the Bell staging system? So what we did was that we took all the infants that were, were admitted to our department from 2006 to the end of 2015. And then I screened all the charts of infants that had a neck code. We uh, classify according to bells and we also use the ICD-10 system. So if they had neck at either of one them, we looked at the chart. Or if they had abdominal surgery, we also looked at the chart because we wanted to get as many neck infants as possible. So we had 158 neck infants. And then at first, we looked the entire chart through for each infant and we staged them with, um, according to bells. But we also used surgical descriptions, um, what medication did the infants get, what did the blood tests say, what did autopsy say, what did pathology say, and we used all the data we had to classify the infants into bells stage one, two, and three. So not only the bedside data that you should normally use. And then afterwards, um, I went back to the chart again and I took only the things that you're supposed to use for bell staging system. So only the abdominal symptoms, uh, which could be um, that, that's gastric discoloration, gastric tenderness, uh, well, abdominal tenderness, um, uh, abdominal bleeding. Um, and then we made a systemic severity score to see how ill the infant was, how many se sepsis-like signs it had. And then we had a, um, a pediatric radiologist look at the radiographic findings to see what did the infant have pneumatosis, pneumopatoneum, interloop thickening, all of these things. And then we put all this into a statistical model and made a primary component analysis. And for those of you that are not that familiar with that statistical analysis, I'll try to get you through it. We don't have that much time, so I'll just tell you the, the final uh, conclusion that we got from it afterwards. But when you make a primary component analysis, you get a scoring plot and a loading plot. And this is called the scoring plot. And what you, all the dots you see here represent a neck case. So these are all the neck cases we had in our department. And what you want to look for in a primary component analysis scoring plot is patterns. Do the, do the infants here separate from one another? And this pattern is conducted by putting the parameters I used, which were the ones you use to um, diagnose according to bells. They were put into it. And this, this show the variability of the data. So two infants that are li lying close together, like maybe these two, they co-vary. So this infant will probably have a lot of the same symptoms and radiographic findings as the other. So those that look alike clinically with the abdominal systemic signs and the radiographs, they will lie close to one another. And then I colored them according to the initial staging that we did where we had the entire medical file. And what we saw was that, the ne this is biological data, so they're not completely separated, but we think that here in the lower right quadrant, most of the ne stage one infants are, the stage two infants are here, and the stage three infants are here. And then we have the SIP cases here. And some of them have located over here, but mostly over here. And, and we know that, that neck three and SIP is difficult to um, distinguish often. So, so if I lost some of you, the basic thing we thought we could see from this was that well, bells does actually still work um, on contemporary infants. So we think it, it does not seem to be outdated in a contemporary cohort, even though the infants are very much different. 
But what about the validity? Because when doing this study, and we could sit together, me and my research student and a neonatologist and a pediatric surgeon, and there was disagreement on some of the infants, even though we had all the data available on whether or not it was a NIC3 or a SIP or NIC2. So I thought, well, when we uh, classify these infants at discharge, how valid is this diagnosis? The attending clinician, we know they sit, oh, did, did this infant have neck? Well, one, two, and three. And you decide rather quickly because you need to, to get things done. So how is the validity of such a diagnosis that you get them at discharge? Luckily for me, another study had been performed where we had 714 infants who had been diagnosed with neck at discharge, but then also afterwards by an expert panel um, who looked more thoroughly into the case. And that was for another study. But then I could use these data to see, well, did they agree? And uh, at discharge, 79 of these infants were diagnosed with neck. But when the expert panel sat down and looked the cases through, only 57 were diagnosed with neck. Uh, in our unit, you cannot choose spontaneous intestinal perforation as an, it's not, you, you're not able to cross it off in the sheet. So at discharge, that wasn't an option. So I think most, most of them got the diagnosis of neck, but seven of them here by the expert panel, they said this was spontaneous intestinal perforation and not neck. And more interestingly, three, uh, nine of the infants who were diagnosed with neck stage three actually suffered from another intestinal disease, according to the expert panel. We decided the expert panel was the golden standard. Of course, there is no golden standard for these things, but that's was what we decided. The incidence at discharge was 11.1%, but when we look at what the expert panel said, and when we said, well, neck and SIP, let's just say it's the same thing, because they couldn't choose SIP in our discharge sheet, the incidence still fell to 9%, which was significant. And if we said SIP is not the same thing as neck, it even fell to 8%, which was hi highly significant. So we published a paper on this. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to say something about predictive values. Is it important? Does it matter? Do, who cares if it's 11 or 9%? Well, if you want to do clinical studies and you want to know more about neck, and we want to be more clever in the future on how to prevent neck, it's actually really important. Because if you look at the positive predictive values, you'll be disappointed, I think. If we, at this chart, had an infant and we said, the attending clinician said, this infant did not have neck. Well, it's okay. There's a 97% chance that the expert panel will say the same. But if the clinician attending said, this infant has neck at this chart, there's only 61% chance that the expert panel will say that the infant has neck. So that's not looking so good for our clinical studies, is it? So I think that when we are doing clinical studies with neck as an outcome, we need to be really, really sure what we are doing when diagnosing the infants with neck and maybe not just use it, using the code that they got at discharge. And we published this paper and said that it validity was poor. When you do so, you're always a little bit scared that the community will just look at us and say, well, they're doing very bad in Denmark, but our <laughs> Our validity is much better. Luckily, the Swedes did a similar study the next year and they found the same. Their incidence decreased from 6.3% to 4.3% when they had experts looking the cases through. And this was even though they, what they write in the article was that they, they tried really hard to get it right the first time. So, what are we going to do in the future? Um, it's really um, interesting when you're a neck researcher what we're going to do. I see we have three um, opportunities. We can choose one of the existing ones and maybe just everyone uses the same. We can modify one of the existing ones or we can make a brand new one. Recently some British neck researchers have published a paper where they suggest we use a gestational age specific classification system um, because term neck is different from preterm neck which is probably correct but I don't think it's the right way to go because it gets very complicated and I, I we are not going to be able to compare to the old studies of neck, and we need to get everyone to use a brand new classification. And I think that's a big ship, try, ship you'll try to get to sail the other way. Maybe you can, in the future, make a new classification where you include the biomarkers. It would be wonderful if uh, the research that is going on will find something soon. I think I mostly like number two. Um, but I'm very biased because we use bells and I've done a lot of research on it. But I like the bell staging system and if you can 
maybe um, modify it a little bit so that you also use the surgical reports and the pathological data. But if you don't have that, you go back to Bell Station System and use that. I think that would be a good way to go. But uh, maybe some of the, the big pings in uh, neonatology need to sit together and decide what we are going to do in the future. That would be nice. Thank you.